HR audits, not the sexiest topic in the world, but clearly important because we're, we're full here. So, so what is of such great interest about HR audits? What are you here to, to listen to? I was going to say, I'm a great HR person, just like all of you. I'll stand here and just stare at you, right? <laughs> How to survive with an audit from a regulatory agency? Like, what can we do to prepare for okay. it so we don't have those pitfalls or mistakes? Okay, so we got the regulatory thing. Clearly, we're going to talk about that. What else? Ah, <laughs> before someone else does. So we're going to be a little proactive. Excellent. Anyone else have something they specifically want to hear about? Oh, that's a good one. We're going to look at that too. So from an audit perspective, not just looking at regulatory issues, whether proactively or reactively, but what about here for our own procedures, our processes, and that sort of thing. So we're going to look at all of that stuff and more. We're going to look at the pros and cons. So my goal for all of you is that you leave here with lots of ideas, okay, and, and actually with the things that, that you can rock and roll with when, uh, when we get at it. So, uh, what we're going to look at in, uh, in that vein is what type of audit do we need to do? What do we want to do? And what should the scope of that audit be? So we're going to look at a number of different types of audits. We're going to look at how we develop, whether we call it the questionnaire, the document that's going to govern the audit and what should be in that. Okay? We're going to take a look at how we collect our data and then benchmark the findings. Because data is great to the extent that, that we can collect reliable data, but if we don't have an idea of what it means or anything to compare it to, maybe we're not sure how well we're really doing. So we'll take a look at that. And then how do we, get, how do we provide feedback to the folks that are outside of HR that may have a stake in this audit? Or that we need our, their help in order to implement the necessary changes? And then obviously we've got to have an action plan. So I'm a big believer that if we're going to take the time, really to do anything in business, but for today's topic, if we take the time to do an audit, we ought to be committed to doing something about it, right? Um, I take calls from companies all the time, well, we're just gonna do an audit. Okay, so what are you gonna do with it? Well, I just wanna know where I stand. Not what I asked. <laughs> what are you gonna do with it? Because what happens once we do the audit and get the results? I'm sorry? Why do we need to act on them? Ah, right? So there is some uh, bliss and ignorance, right? Well, we didn't know, we didn't know, and maybe that argument will get us a little bit far, but once we know and we don't do anything, now we're in trouble, right? So we have to develop an action plan. We're gonna talk about that as well, okay? What needs to be in it, how we wanna plan for that going forward. Okay, so here's a definition I like to use of an HR audit, okay? Take a look at it, and, and I will say, I break all the rules of presenting. I believe in giving you guys meat, um, I don't like going to presentations where it's just a picture up there. So um, anyone who wants these slides can absolutely have them, okay? So I don't want you fearlessly scrib scribbling notes. So uh, when I look at this, I think about an audit as a, as a being a review of processes, okay? And those processes can be anything that we do in HR. So think about some processes that you're doing every day, every month, every year, that you might like to have a benchmark on? What would they be? What about higher? So compliance with the clearances that you need in your organization, okay? That's a good check. Other processes. What about them? Making sure their process is timely. Okay. Taking care of the employee and then everything would happen. Okay, so we're checking boxes on the exit, going out the back door. What else? Record retention. Okay, I-9 audits, right? You guys have probably talked uh, to staff members who maybe do, maybe you do your own I-9s, or maybe you have staff members that do them. Uh, for those of you that have staff members do them, how often do they tell you that I-9s are perfect until you look at them? <laughs> Show of hands, you're all laughing, but I wanna see this, right? Always, right? Oh, they're always perfect. My experience is anytime I go to look at I-9s, I find about an 80% defect rate in I-9. And it's really not a hard document, is it? I mean, I don't think so, but it's that, that's my experience. Anyone else that high? Got one higher, right? We got one higher. So 
That's a great check, right? That's one that's critical. It's a compliance related thing, but that's a good process to check. Other processes in HR we may want to check. Credentialing. I'm sorry? Credentialing. Credentialing. So what does that mean in your organization? Uh, check and make sure that the license is current and gets to Okay, so uh, healthcare, let's say, right? Perfect example there of, of are people keeping up with their you know CPAs or or healthcare workers, those kind of things, critical. Other processes, yeah. Personnel problem. What about what's in them? Oh come on, that's where we just throw everything, right? <laughs> Put everything we want in those personnel files. So yeah, another great example, right? Give me one thing that shouldn't be in a personnel file. <laughs> Medical, right? But what do you find in personnel files? <laughs> Medical stuff, sick notes and workers' comp claims and all kinds of stuff in there. Results of drug tests. They just get thrown in there, right? So that's a good check. Another process. Exempt, non-exempt. Exempt, non-exempt. There's a good one, right? Really hot topic, what, 12, 12 months ago, right? So, sure, how often do we look at that, especially in an organization that's really changing rapidly? Uh, I, you know, I have folks that, that call me and say, hey, we've got to look at this position again. We just looked at it last year. Yeah, but it changed again. That's pretty cool that they want to stay up on that sort of thing, and, and sometimes we don't do that. When's a great time to check your exemption status? Okay, annually, but give me, a, give me a time. Of course you do, right? Because that's a great time to look at the job description in and of itself. So, you know, if you can start to couple some of these things up, that makes following your processes. Okay, we're gonna, oh yeah, go ahead, please. Independent contractor versus. Another good one, right? So independent contractor versus employee. And again, that line can sometimes move, right? Based on are you giving the person email accounts and laptops, or you know, are you telling them what time they have to be at the office? And yeah, you're groaning, but you know it happens, right? So, um, so that's another good one. So let's uh, let's move on here and take a look at the scope. What do we want to look at? So let's start off and, and think about how many of you would dare to undertake an audit of your entire function? <laughs> Come on, why not? There, I had one. Well, here's, a, here's an offer. Why would you do that? Because they didn't have it. They, they, I'm sorry, they didn't. They didn't have an HR person. So there's a great example, right? So we don't have an HR person, or it's some non HR professional running the HR function, right? Uh, I, I had a talk with a not for profit the other day, 100 some employees, no HR influence. I said, well, who can? Oh, my CFO's got a good handle on that. And I said, I'm sure your CFO's a smart person, but I'm a full time HR professional. I have trouble keeping up with stuff. Right? So again, that's a great example where we may want to look at the whole of our, of our function. What's the downside to that? Well, okay, what you're going to find. <laughs> We're in the safe zone here, right? Yeah. You've got limited resources. Okay. Sure. So you've got limited resources to fix the problems, but also, limit, depending on the size of your organization, this is a heck of an undertaking, right? Think about everything that we touch as HR pros. So it's not, it's not bad to do this every now and then. You're going to need a team to make it happen. But again, it's the resource up front and then the resource of fixing as well. Okay. So what if we just took a look at your policies and procedures? What's the good and bad of that? Just policies and procedures. So we're not checking to be sure that I-9s are done in a timely manner, I mean, or, or that they're done, they're done in a timely manner. That's what I'm talking about in terms of policies and procedures versus a check the box kind of thing. So what's the advantage of doing that? Okay, so legal changes, right? They change how we need to do things. What else? Training, there's a good, good opportunity where maybe someone just has not been kept up to date with the things that we like to do and the way we like to do them. That's a good one. Okay, consistency is huge, especially if you're, you're trying to go across departments or across functions across the country, the world. Yeah? Similarly, practice or policy. Okay, that, that's a great one. And I see that a little bit different, right? What's, what do we say we're doing? What's actually happening, right? That's, that's a critical one, and that's one that a lot of folks don't often do. 
They say, oh, well, you know, I've got great procedures and policies in place. Okay, what's our adherence to those? Especially when you're dealing with folks outside of your department who are influencing those processes and those procedures. Okay? How many of you are in a situation where maybe the hiring decisions are made at other locations from your, say, like a retail environment where it's a store manager or something, just something along those lines? Okay? What's your biggest challenge in that, that sort of environment? Just the general communication. General communication? Between the HR component and the actual hiring component. So, uh, yeah, so between HR and the folks that are hiring, how about you? I'm just thinking on the issue that Okay. And all that is completed when it should be. Okay. How many of you have gotten the call about Joe not getting his paycheck on Friday and you ask who's Joe? <laughs> okay. I had I had a, a client that, that that was a regular occurrence for the HR function. They had a, you know, it was, they were spread out across the country, they had hiring managers that were also their kind of operation managers, and they would just hire people and think that the payroll ferry was going to show up with a check every Friday. And <laughs> HR literally did not know that people were on, on the book. So uh, so that's an example of, yeah, let's look at the procedures that are in place and do they match up with what's actually happening. Okay, so that's a good one. All right. Um, here's one that, that I want to spend some time on. What about the connection between your business strategy and how HR planning, staffing, all of that connects in? What would be the benefit of that? Stumper. Do you see a benefit to it? Okay, good, good. So we're on the same page there. So you're nodding, ma'am. What's? Okay. Are they totally different? Okay. Are we together? Or are we not? What would be? Go ahead. Um, I mean, it brings HR to the table. It shows businesses that we have a whole business Okay. I agree, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that as perhaps one of the reasons why when we do our audits, we don't hoard the results to ourselves, whether they're good or bad. Okay? One of our biggest challenges, we've been hearing it for the last decade, is HR needs a seat at the table. And I was looking you know, from a, you know, a self-critical standpoint, what am I doing to get to the table? How am I thinking? Am I thinking like a business manager? Am I thinking about my function of HR as being a business function? Not unlike sales or R&D or operations or you know, whatever other functions that you have. Right? We are a business function. I was teaching one of the, the SHRM certification classes at our local chapter. And the first night, you know, we had folks go around and introduce themselves. This one young, young lady said, oh, I'm fresh out of social work. And I really wanted, I wanted to get into HR, and I said, well, well why? She says, because I want to prove that all HR people aren't mean. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, we're not all mean. Let's start there, right? Uh, but then I, then I thought to myself, let's think about that for a minute. If you come with that sort of mindset, what mindset are you not bringing to the table? What is our primary role in HR? To be, to be what? Support the business. Thank you. That is our prerogative in HR, to support the business. Now, how we support the business comes through the things that, that we mentioned, okay? Employee retention and yada, yada, yada. Okay, but yes. And, and so when I think about this in terms of corporate strategy, how often do we look at HR as a business function and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. How many of you have for your departments an HR strategy in place? I'm not talking about a recruiting strategy. That's just one piece. I'm talking about an HR strategy from a, a goal setting standpoint and it's tied directly into your corporate strategy. Okay, just, a, just a couple of you raising your hands. Good. Pack some in the back. I'm sure there's others. But think about that. Okay? If we're running HR like a business function, then we should be making sure that our business function is aligned with the greater good of the business. What percent, typically, of an organization's budget does HR represent? <laughs> most of it. Okay. I don't know about most of it, but it's a big chunk. Anyone want to take a guess? Okay. A little 
high-ish. I mean, usually we see 30, 30, you know, kind of on the industry and, and how people intensive it is versus technology intensive or machine intensive. But, you know, 30, 40% is a big chunk of a budget, right? So we need to be making sure that not only do our other business partners understand how big of a role we play, but if we start talking in terms of, of we are a business partner, we represent 30% of what's going on in this company, we'll have our seat at the table. We're not going to be banging on the door to get in. And if we're real lucky, we're going to have the cushiest seat at the table. Okay? And so audits are one way that we can look at this in terms of what we uncover, how we uncover them, and then how we work on the things that we find. Okay? So finally, we get to the softer side of things, employee retention, employee motivation. What are the benefits here? They're obvious, but let's, let's chat about it. Okay, obviously we want to reduce turnover. Okay, satisfaction. Trends in. Okay. So we have a turnover, organizational climate. Okay. Got a call from an organization two weeks ago. 75% turnover. High, right? No, it's not retail. This is a food production facility. Here's now, you look at that and say, oh, we got to do something about that, right? And we do. But this HR manager is pretty savvy. She said, Ed, here's why. They, these are unskilled jobs, okay? That, so it, it's not that they're putting a lot of training and all that other time, and they are, but here's the real business problem. The real business problem is that because they cannot keep people, and therefore they never really get ramped up, they can't keep up with production. Every time they fall behind in production, now their, their facility's down in central Pennsylvania. Their other US facility is in California. And that means when they get behind in production, they have to ship product to California to be serviced. And every time they do that, and right now they're doing it two to three times a month, $45,000 to get that product back across country. Mind you, their product is typically coming from Asia, so it's already coming through the West Coast and now it's going back. Now, from a business perspective, if we just approach, oh, it's a turnover problem, and we, we want to be able to say that our people are happy, and let's get turnover down to 10%. Okay, the bigger issue here, what's costing them more money than the constant hiring, is that shipping of product at 45 grand a pop, two and three times a month, back to the West Coast. And then if you start to think about, oh, well, the customers aren't getting their product in time, and all that snowball effect, right? So those are the ways when we're, we're thinking about looking at our HR function that we need to really think in terms of being business partners. Not just showing up at the, the manager's meeting and saying, oh, look, I did a 9-9 audit, we're 99% effective. Your average manager probably doesn't even know what a 9-9 is, much less care that you're 99% effective at it, right? Not that it's not important, but is it important to the other business partners? Okay, and so we'll talk about that when we talk about this. All right, so let's talk about some benefits. I think we hit a lot of them already. One of the things is folks don't always know what we do, right? They think that we sit there, we plan the company party, we uh, send out, uh, I, I don't know, gifts to our employees when it's their anniversary, we manage open enrollment, we're terrible at hiring. Uh, what, else, what else do they expect? Of, well, it's true, right? Right? You can have one in a hundred be bad, and we're all, we've all made bad hires. I mean, we can admit that, right? We're, we've all been there. Uh, but they remember that one. Now, forget the other 99 that are still working for productive employees. There's that one that you made the mistake on, they tell us about, right? What else do they see out of HR, though, in terms of strategy and how we're helping their function meet their goals? That's really one of the true benefits of an HR audit, is helping those, those line managers to see that what HR is doing brings value, especially if we can get those line managers involved in the audit process. Okay. Next thing is think about your image outside of HR, right? What is that image? What is the perception of folks in your organization of HR, maybe of you personal, from a professionalism standpoint. 
Now, again, I'm an HR guy just like the rest of you, right? So I'm, I'm talking about me as well. And I'm not saying we have to wear you know, shirt and tie and business suits every day. That, that's, that's, you know, appearance is only part of professionalism, right? But I was at a function. It was around Valentine's Day. And it was an HR function. And it was a business meeting of HR folks. And so because it's around Valentine's Day, you saw lots of red, which is cool. But you saw guys wearing the heart ties and uh, women wearing little flashing hearts and whatever. All the stuff that we, silly stuff that we do around Valentine's Day. You can say in Patrick's Day, right? It just happened to be Valentine's Day. And while it's fun, I had to ask myself, is anyone else in the office dressed like this? Are any other business executives walking around with flashing hearts on their lapels? or hearts on their ties, or shamrocks kissing on my eyelids, whatever, the holiday is, okay? I'm not a party pooper, okay? I'm really not, but I'm asking you to think about that and me. What is the image of HR? Sometimes we're our own worst enemy, because we want to, we start thinking about what's, what's gonna make the employees come to us, what's gonna get them to open up to us, and those are good things, right? But the flip side is, what are we doing to drive value to our business partners. Early on in my career, probably the first year or so I was in HR, I was working at UPS. That's where I, I cut my teeth, I left the docks as a, as a college kid, drove a little bit, the whole, the whole thing. And I used to, to come in, so of course UPS, you've got folks that are loading the trucks in the middle of the night. And I come in and I just, I just walk around. And the management team used to be say, bro, must be nice, you show up with your coffee, you walk around, you shoot the bull with people for a couple hours, and you do it because it's summertime and you want to leave early. Okay? That's the perception. Until one day I went to the manager and said, hey, we have a problem. And I talked to him about a very serious personnel problem that was creeping up over on one of our conveyor belts, one of our work areas. And we talked through it. And then he realized that, well, wait a minute. You know, the management team there is too busy running the operation to just spend time and talk with people and hear what's going on and see what's going on. My three or four hours a week of just literally walking around on that ship to chat with people and see, started paying dividends, and then the management team started clicking that, oh, Ed's here today, and they would start pulling me in. Hey, we're over there in that side of the building because we've got something going on over there, and I can't put my finger on it. Maybe you can. It was a transition that didn't happen overnight, but again, no show of hands, but how much time do we spend doing that sort of thing, right? Where we're trying to be, someone mentioned earlier, being proactive with finding things. I was doing an audit with an organization. It was a uh, long-term care facility, and they had what they called a campus, so you had lots of different buildings. And as I was talking, part of the audit involved talking with the different key managers. And I kept hearing this despise of HR. And yet it wasn't directed towards the HR reps. They had a staff of about four or five HR people. And oh, I love my rep. She's great and she's this and she's that. So well, wait, why don't you like HR? I don't like the director. And I kept hearing this theme over and over again over the several weeks. So I saved my interview of the HR director for last. Sat down with him and very dry personality. Okay, that's fine. And so finally, after we spent about a half hour together, I said, you know, I, I'm going to be honest with you because that's what I'm here to do. The perception of HR is not good out there. He says, I know. Okay, so we're self-aware. This is a good thing. Uh, but he thought it was HR, not himself. So not totally self-aware, okay? And so I said, well, no, your, your reps, the staff loves your reps. They like to get good service from your reps. It's you. So we talked about that. I said, the biggest complaint is that you're not out there. They never see you. And here's where it gets scary, folks. He said to me, mind you, this is an HR director, $20 million retirement care community, large entity, right? I've, I have to spend, I, I can't get out from behind my desk because I'm, I'm up to my ears in workers' comp and unemployment paperwork. Now think about that for a minute. Why is an HR director doing unemployment and workers' compensation paperwork? Why would he do that? 
Somebody help me out. Maybe he doesn't trust his staff, and he should. What else? I'm sorry? He hasn't trained them. It's tangible work. It's tangible work. It's things that he wanted to do. And he could sit there and say, well, I can't get to like this. i got to do all this stuff, right? But the professional image is that you don't have And he didn't have any sense of what was going on out in the operation. Really a shame. Okay? So let's see about reducing HR costs. Because we all know we're viewed as cost center, right? It's all we hear. You're overhead. You're overhead. So maybe we can reduce costs through efficiencies. Or maybe, what's the flip side of the equation? We can do what? I'm sorry? Maybe. Go ahead. Help increase profits. How about if we can start to show how the fact that, great, I can go to the board meetings and say we've got 5% turnover. And that's probably good turnover, right? Because we want some. And most of the people around that table are going to say, great, wonderful, pat you on the back. But what does that really mean, that 5% turnover? Where are we saving costs in training? Can we document that that low turnover has increased production, has increased quality, increased customer satisfaction? Can we get our arms around those things? Because if we can, now we're not a cost center anymore, are we? Now we're as much of the business function as IT and PR and sales and everybody else. So yeah, on one hand, I've got reduced HR costs up here. But I should probably also say, and show value, right? How in the heck does an audit motivate you? I'm sorry? You're being held accountable. We all like to have some level of accountability, so that's, I like that. What else? Transparency. Transparency, right? So again, if sales is not doing their job, everybody sees it. It shows up on the budgets, it shows up on sales reports. If HR is not doing their job, people don't necessarily see it, except when it comes to hiring, right? When they see that machine sitting there with nobody running it, they blame us. Okay? But there are a lot of other things that go into our jobs that if we're not doing, may not be seen, may not be tangible, but certainly have an impact on the business. So that's a good one. What else? Okay. Sure, sure. It's a good chance to pat ourselves on the back. Because we don't get a lot of this. We don't get a lot of pats on the back. Because if we're doing our jobs well, that means there's usually someone upset with us, right? I mean, think about it. I, I always look at HR folks and say, I'm going to make everybody happy. You're not. Not going to happen, right? Not going to happen. So if we're doing our jobs well, there's probably always someone who's saying, nah, 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 grumbling. But there's probably a reason for why we didn't give them what they wanted. Okay, so it's okay if we don't make everybody happy, but that means sometimes that comes at our own personal cost. So it's a good way to reward your team for a job well done as well. It could be something that's simple. All right, let's get into, uh, and then we talked about the, the solving problems. So let's take a look at some different audit tools and what they might, might mean. What are the benefits? Now, and when, I, when I, we look at these tools, let's just look at them individually, not as a collective piece, okay? So from an interview perspective, if, if all you did was use interviewing as a way of gathering information, give me some, some pros and cons to that. Why? Different levels. Okay. Okay, but that's not bad, right? Okay. What else is... Yeah. Just sometimes if it's face-to-face, -face, people don't want to actually tell you what they're thinking. Okay. So we can hide behind the computer screen on the employee opinion survey, <laughs> but you sit down with HR, and they're waiting for the pink slip to come out kind of thing, right? Did I see something over here? Yeah. Uh, everyone inherently lies. What? <laughs> no. <laughs> I never lie. <laughs> I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan at heart. Yeah. So... so so it's a challenge, right? Let's put it in a better light. People are not always completely forthcoming with their opinions on things. Okay? So that's a challenge for us. What's the good side? 
Sure, sure. So we can let the conversation go where it needs to go. What's one of the, the biggest downsides to interviews, though? Time, right? It takes a lot of time. If I wanted to, if we were all a function and I wanted to audit and sit down and spend even a half hour with all of you, that's several weeks worth of just interviewing, right? And we got a few other things we got to do with each other. So it's a challenge, okay? How about the questionnaire? So you've already mentioned one of our challenges is how good are the questions on the questionnaire, okay? What else is good and bad about it? If we just say, okay, I need to, to <coughs> gather information from 200 people, I'm going to do it through the questionnaire. What's the good and bad of that? <coughs> Oh. <laughs> well then, welcome. <laughs> you know, I've never been booed off the stage, but this is a new one. Just turn the lights out, maybe the guy will shut up, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm sorry, low response rate, okay? So. Whether we send it out via paper or whether we do something from an internet perspective, if someone's not required to fill it out, are they going to fill it out? Right? So what are we going to get? 20% back, 30% back, maybe? Is that really a representation of what's going on? Probably not, because the people who send it back are the good ones and the really bad ones. <laughs> that 80% in the middle, probably not telling the same. What else? Okay, so confidentiality and anonymity can be challenges with that. So there are ways around those things. I mean, maybe you have a third party administer the questionnaires and where the questionnaires go back to that third party, that sort of thing. So you can manage that, but that's still, people are going to be inherently a little like, oh, how are they going to track it down? They're going to know exactly who sent this. I'm going to be fired for my opinion. Okay, um, so that's a challenge. So, you know, again, none of these are perfect, but it's good to, to kind of think through where we want to go with these things. Okay, how about uh, just simple document review? So think about this in terms of I go to the files and I start pulling stuff out. Start looking for whatever it is I'm looking for. What's the good and bad of that? Okay, so larger organizations probably only get a sampling, right? You have 3,000 employees, you're probably not pulling 3,000 employee files. So you're doing a sample. And then the question becomes, well, what's a good sample size for me? Okay, so that's a good one. What else? Yes, ma'am. You may not have things, so you're not getting a sample of something you want. Ah, so we're just missing things across the board. So, you know, I, I hear that and I think about, okay, I go to the employee files, and in 20% of what I find, I see sign off on a drug policy. Okay, so are they the exceptions to the rule that we had them sign the policy? Or is it the fact that 80% of people don't have it? Is that the norm? Is it a policy we just started? Is it, so that gets iffy, right? So we've got to know just the, the fact that there's not something in the file doesn't mean it shouldn't be there. So that's a challenge for us on pulling documents. What else? Uh, that's cool for an external audit is always the one that doesn't well, absolutely, right? EEOC, OSHA, whoever shows up, there it's Murphy's Law, right? They're gonna interview your worst employee, they're gonna yeah, so so none of those three give us everything that we need. So what's the logical conclusion? Yeah, maybe there's a blend, right? Now let's talk about sampling, because we can sample with all of these. So sampling means we're just yanking a hundred of our 2,000 files. We're going to yank certain documents, not the whole file, but certain documents out of the file. So we've talked about, obviously, the, the pros and cons of that. But for large organizations, that may be our only recourse. But what's a great way to ensure the integrity of the results that we're getting if we're sampling? Okay, we can do random. What about a specific sample? Targeting sample. So I'm not going to yank 100 employees out of 1,000 to see what's in their file. I'm going to go after a specific document in my sample. Okay. 
So maybe we target that sampling. So okay, the first 100 employees I look at, I'm checking I-9. The next 100 employees I look at, I'm going to check that their certifications are up to date. The next 100 employees I pull, I'm going to check whatever doc, right? So maybe your sample and what you're looking for starts to shift a little bit. Again, it's not an exact science. We're still at the mercy of, boy, we could pull all 100, and those 100 could be the only 100 that are perfect, right? Or they could be the only 100 that there's nothing perfect about. But we can have a bit of a moving target there. So you have to know your situation. That, that's the key with, with the sample, is how often do you want to sample? How large is the sample size? What do you have time to do? But certainly in larger organizations, it's going to be the way to go. All right, so let's take a look at some different types of audits that we can do. Because so often when we, we hear the term audit, if you're like me, you think about, oh, I'm going to pull files, I'm going to sit down and check paperwork. Okay? But someone mentioned this one earlier, where we're looking at compliance with our own policies and procedures. What's that going to tell us? <clears throat> What's the benefit? Okay, so maybe we find that there's only one department that's causing us trouble with hiring and getting us their paperwork back. So no need to call everyone on the carpet. We're going to work with one department trying to get them back on track. Okay, that's a help. What else is a help? Okay. Maybe it's outdated, right? Maybe our policy, our process is outdated. Because we're all doing things just because we've always done them. And we don't always remember why. And the classic example I remember was with a company that when you checked in and checked out, you stopped at the receptionist's desk, they had a binder, and at the end of the week she took the paper page out of the binder, it went over here, whatever. Now, years go by, they've done this, they implement some kind of timekeeping system and a system where, because they, they, some of them were professionals, so they were in and out on sales calls and whatnot, but for building security purposes, you logged out of your computer and they knew that you were not on site. But guess what? Folks were still signing out with the receptionist. And this went on for a while until someone went and said, why, why do we do this? And the receptionist said, I don't know, it's, I'm just supposed to do it. And so literally for a couple of years, after this technology was in place, they were still signing out. Now that's a very small thing, but we all have those small things that we're doing that's a redundancy that is completely unnecessary, right? That can show some of those things. If we involve some of the managers that are the biggest challengers of a process, perhaps they'll start to see why that process is in place to begin with why we need to get it fixed, what the results of that are. And so when we look at this, ultimately what we're trying to do is figure out, one, do we need the process? Does it still work for us? Is it still necessary? Is it working as is? Or do we need to change it? Or can we just toss the thing because it's redundant? Or it adds no value? Are there things that we're doing, please no show of hands, <laughs> that provide zero value? <laughs> we just do them. Okay? That's a problem for us. It's a serious problem for us. Because I think one of the biggest image challenges that we have in HR is that we are just sticklers for process. Okay? I'm a Gen Xer. If you know anything about the generations, and I hope you do, Gen Xers don't care about process. We care about results, right? Much to the chagrin of baby boomers who like the process. So again, I'm not advocating we don't cover our tracks, we don't document, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, does the process support the result, right? What result are we trying to get to with the process we're putting in place? And that's why we want to look at that, okay? All right, next one. So the HR climate, this isn't within your department, but this is all things I think about like organizational culture, okay? So this is where we get into the turnover, the absenteeism. Maybe we're looking at safety, OSHA reportable injuries, if that falls under HR in your organization. What's, what's going to be telling about this sort of thing? Turnover is an, an obvious one. What could absenteeism tell us? An audit on our absenteeism rates. What could that tell us? Okay, could be a sign of lack of engagement. Is it company wide or specific to one? 
Okay, so particular department, particular work shift having issues with absenteeism. Okay, so are there other services that we could add on? Is it stress related? Are we working too much overtime? Is there correlation to injury rates? Are injury rates going up and absenteeism rates are going up too? Probably a correlation there. Okay, are injury rates every, or excuse me, absentee rates every Monday and Tuesday during football season? <laughs> Could be a problem, right? Every time. Okay, so what land am I in up here? Is, am I in Giants territory? Am I in Patriots territory? Bills, all the above? You guys a mishmash up here? <laughs> mishmash, okay. So uh, every night, so I'll just go with it. So uh, when the Giants play on Monday Night Football, Tuesdays you have absentees. Is it that simple or not? I don't know. So when we think about those kinds of things, we say, okay, is there another correlation here? I was working with an organization, very, very large organization. They have people, believe it or not, whose job it is solely, 40 hours a week, to go check on people who have called in sick. <laughs> now this is archaic to me. Can't imagine that they used to have three full-time people that do this, but they do, and they have a whole discipline system. You don't answer your door when they, they knock, you don't answer your phone. I mean, it's, it's insane, okay, it's insane. Now, there's a whole lot of other issues going on at this joint, okay? So, but do you want that job? Because I'll tell you what, when I'm sick, I'm sick. To leave me alone, if I sleep for a day, I'm good. Don't come knocking at my door and calling me. And, yeah. But anyway, that's probably not how we want to go about an absentee is on it. So, anyway. okay. So let's look at different approaches, okay? And we're going to look at each of these individually because there's a lot of different ways that we can go about auditing our HR process. So let's start off with a comparative approach. And we'll talk about the pros and cons of each of these. So this is where we say, okay, here's another company I want to be like. Perhaps it's a competitor, perhaps it's not. Maybe it's someone who just in your community has a really good reputation on that particular front. And you say, you know what, I'm going to audit myself against them. That's what we're talking about here. What are the pros of doing something like that? Okay, we have a benchmark established, right? Which is that organization. If we can trust their results, right? That's the big thing. If we can trust the results, we've got a benchmark. What else is a good thing? Well, we still got to compare ourselves, right? Right? But they may have questionnaires developed. They may have the audit tool already processed and ready to go. And the results that are verified is not unreasonable expectation other than Okay. Sure. So if, if they've achieved these results and they're similar to us in terms of size and geography, maybe not product or whatever, but yeah, maybe then we can say, well it's it's feasible for us to get there. So this isn't bad, right? What's the downside of this? And just don't tell me the opposite of everything we just said. <laughs> Culture. Okay, so cultures is a huge factor, right? I was involved in a merger of two organizations that on paper should have blended perfectly. Geographically, they abutted each other. Same services, same size. I mean, it was amazing. Problem was, two extremely, when I, can't, I can't even begin to describe to you how different the cultures were. Guess what? The company merged anyway. It's no longer in existence. It blew up. It blew up. It took about five years, but it blew up. And, and it was solely because of that. So, yeah, they looked. They went out looking for a merger partner. And they thought they found one, but they forgot about one of the most important pieces. So that's huge. Thank you for that. What else is, is a challenge on this front? Benchmark with a, with a company. And every time you mention that company's name, employees go, they hate it. Hmm. They don't like to be compared. They don't want to be compared. So that's interesting. Do you know why? Um, I think because we're trying to hold them, um, we're trying to model ourselves after that. Okay. And they're used to not think that will change. So different mindset. Okay. Different mindset. Hmm. Okay. It's not just the culture, but the business strategies. Sure. Sure. 
Uh, we could spend all day talking about different business strategies, but if one business strategy is customer focused and one business strategy is operationally focused, that, that's a challenge for us, right? So, yeah, I mean, and can you find someone who's willing to share their deep dark secrets with you? Now, you've got each other, we do, in HR. There could be someone in here that you could do this with. Okay, maybe you have to do it on the sly, but maybe you could do this to find out what's going on. Okay, so it doesn't have to be a, a cold call to another organization. You've got a great network just in your own chapters in here at, at State Council. Okay? All right, let's take a look at an outside authority. So this is someone else coming in, you opening the doors up, a la Bar Rescue, and John Tacker comes in, and he's going to tell you what you're doing wrong, right? So, what's the, the good side of that? Okay, the person's impartial. So, if they've got specific industry expertise, they can come and say, in your industry, if we're coming to your size, you should be at X amount of FTEs, and you should have so many people in your HR function, and you should be at this turnover, and all that stuff. Okay, that's not bad. What else is a good thing with this? You, you, what about the credibility? I'm sorry? Okay, you're getting that person's credibility. Absolutely. So, provided you've vetted that individual and you know they're an authority in your industry, that's great. Fresh set eyes. Sure. We get used to, how many times have you written something, you've reread it three or four times, and you send the email, and then you go back and go, what the heck was I trying to say? I mean, because we see just, just we do it, it's human nature, right? So sometimes it's that outside, uh, that outside set of eyes. Now, what's the flip side? What's the challenge with this one? Yeah. When the consultant reflects back um, data that the employees have been telling leadership for months or years, uh -huh. and it's, it's fresh and new when the consultant says, uh -huh. but mm -hmm. then it kills employee morale. It can, well, all employee morale or HR? HR, yes, yes, okay? And, and I'm sensitive to that, because I see it. I see, Ed, you need to come in because they're not listening to me. And that's a shame. It's an absolute shame. There are model of strategy needs to be adjusted to fit your organization. Mm -hmm. It's not a one size. It can't be a cookie cutter, right? So, so you have to have someone who's willing to work with you on developing the process, developing whether it's the questionnaires or the structure of the interviews, that sort of thing. Absolutely. And if they're not, again, that's a problem. Cost. It could be cost, right? So now instead of using internal resources, you're looking at external resources. But Let's think like business people. Is there a cost to you doing it in-house? Yes. Yep, there's the cost of your time, efforts, and energy. And so we have to look at that. Again, in terms of being business people, we don't want to just think about the cost. So you hire this outside authority, they give you a figure, you go, oh, I can't afford that. Well, wait a minute. And you say, I'll just do it myself. Well, there's a cost for that. And sometimes it's more. So again, from a business strategy standpoint, we have to look at that. But that's our, it's a, I'll, I'll throw that in the con side simply because that's one more piece of the decision that we have to make, right? In terms of whether or not we can afford to do it ourselves or afford to outsource it, whether we can trust that we're going to get the value out of it. I mean, that, that's a whole other decision mode. Any other cons? Ah, so we're going to spend the money, but, and so we've said, yeah, this is a good value. I can get return on my investment here, and I'm going to get this nice report. Am I going to do anything with it? Because if you don't, obviously you just wasted your money. The flip side is you do it yourself, then you wasted your time, and there's costs associated with it, right? Okay. So uh, let's look at statistics. So you can go out on the Sherm website, get all kinds of HR metrics, right? They're out there. And you say, I'm going to measure myself against those, whatever, wherever we got those from. What's the good side of that? Okay, so we have a baseline. We would assume that if we're getting it from a reliable source, a la Sherm or other professional organization, that they're reliable results, results we can trust, or metrics, excuse me, that we can trust. A what base? Okay, so we've got some, some evidence there to support that because there should be numbers behind those results. How many companies were in these? What size were they? What industries? What geographies? We've got all that evidence in there. Okay, that's good. What else? There you go. 
So they're just numbers. We can remove feelings, personal biases, opinions. We can get rid of all of that. And that's probably a good thing, right? If we can just step back and say, OK, I'm going to try to be objective about this. When we're just looking at metrics, that's, that's usually a really good thing. That's the con side. OK, so we've got statistical bias. Are the numbers skewed? How reliable, again, are those results? We have to ensure that those results, we can verify their reliability. OK? Yeah? Hmm? Right. So if we simply say, oh, our industry average for turnover should be 6%, and were it 8%, does that 2% really matter? Maybe it does and maybe it doesn't. Okay, maybe you're going through a transition where you have an aging workforce, and so you would expect folks have been with you for a, a period of time, and you would expect that they're going to go out in larger numbers. So that extra 2% maybe is not a big deal. But you wouldn't know that unless you knew the demographics behind the numbers. Is that kind of what you're referring to, something along those lines? Okay. So we have to take that into account. What else is, is a challenge with just using a statistical approach? What about, and maybe this is just a variation of what we, we've already discussed, but what about the fact that what we do can't always be quantified? Maybe that's where you were at. Can't always be quantified in a number. So if all we do is look at numbers, we, we've got, yeah, the human piece, the human background, the why is it this way? Yeah. You can't, wait a minute. Can't measure culture, right? <laughs> I had I did have someone tell me one time, you know, our company doesn't really have a culture. <laughs> yeah, funny guy. Um, so, yeah, that's like saying your family doesn't have tradition. Okay, so, uh, and we knew this. But yeah, you, you, there are certain things that cannot be measured that may be more important than the things that we're able to measure. So, what's the moral of the story in terms of all these types of approaches? Yeah, maybe we've got to use more than one. So if we've got to blend the type of audit tool that we use, whether it be sampling versus interviewing versus uh, documentation, maybe we also need to pull a variety of types of these, not just say, oh, like what that guy said about the statistical approach, so I'm going to just use that. You might not get the whole picture. So we may need to blend some of these items as well. Okay. So the compliance approach, that's the easy one. I don't really feel like we need to spend a lot of time. That's what we're checking boxes, right? This is probably, unfortunately, where we spend the bulk of our audit time, is it not? And yet, is that really the bulk of our work? Now, some would argue it's important. I, yeah, absolutely, it's important. I'm not trying to say it's not. But think about the bulk of your work and where you have your impact for your organization. I'm willing to bet that the bulk of that is not compliance related. And yet, we're quick to audit our I-9s, and we're quick to audit our OSHA logs, and again, all those things are important. Don't walk out of here saying, that guy said I didn't have to do that. No, we do. Okay, we do. But I think we do that too much and ignore some of the other things. That's my point. So from a compliance perspective, yeah, we need to check that stuff out. We need to make sure that, that we are in compliance, absolutely. Let's just not put our, all of our eggs in that phase. Right. So how about this one? Managing by objectives. That, that thing's kind of been around. It's been under a number of different names. But this is where we're looking at the goals set by the management team against our actual performance measures. How many of you have done something like that? Only a handful. Now, that could mean that that goes back to our earlier part of the discussion on do we have HR strategic goals that align with our business goals? If not, we can't do this. But again, okay, this one I'll ask, and you guys raise your hands. How many of your companies have a strategic plan? Okay, keep your hands up. How many of you have seen that strategic plan? Okay, a couple hands went down. Okay, and then how many of you have led that plan into HR? 
Okay, those hands stay down. Good. Problem is only about a third of you try. Okay, we try, right? So only about a third of you know for sure your company has a strategic plan. That's a challenge, right? I'm willing to bet you know that your executive team went off to some retreat for a weekend and they said that's what they were doing. And maybe there's a binder on someone's desk that says 2017, 2019 strategic plan. You haven't been shown it. And it's getting dusty now. Because no one else is looking at it either, right? Yeah. I think one good way to stay ahead of the call is to be in the room when the strategy is being set. So Amen. Of the, uh, 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 the, the team that is right there. Yes. Right. So, absolutely. So, for the front of the room, the gentleman said the best way to avoid that is be in the room when the strategy discussions are happening, right? Whoa. Okay? So, but well, we got to bang some doors down. We got to do some other things sometimes to get there if we're not there, right? So, I like this one because it plays to the idea that we are business partners, okay? But if we don't know the strategic goals of the organization, we can't do this. So I would start asking for them. I love the, the whole managing by objectives, where is the company going, and what is HR doing to support that, and measuring ourselves against that. You talk about driving value to your business partners, it's gonna happen in a heartbeat if you look at it from this lens. What's the downside? There's a ton of pros here. What's the downside of this? Anyone want to share? Okay. Are they realistic? Oh, Jelly of the Month Club. Yeah. So we don't have buy-in on the objectives within the organization. So management says this is what they are, and then no one else is bought in. That can be problematic. Okay? And I'll give you a perfect example where this is a challenge. So uh, I mentioned that, that I worked at UPS, and of course one of the, the key drivers at UPS is does box get from A to B in the right amount of time. Now, this is going back about 20 years before all the electronic stuff. Okay? So now that this problem is solved. But pre-electronics, they said, okay, we want to control miss source, which is your box not ending up in Albany, it ended up in Rochester, okay? That's not the driver's fault. He or she did not load the truck. It was some hungover college kid, okay? And so they said, okay, well, we're going to measure this. So when packages would show up in our facility that were not for our facility, we were gigged for that. Does that make any sense to you? No, why? We didn't put it on the truck to get it, but that was the only metric, was that we would enter, we've got 30 packages sitting here, they're not ours. What they should have done was taken the driver's step. Well, wait a minute, we, can, we know what trailer it came out of, and we know what facility, so we didn't do that. So all of us got goose eggs on our performance review for the first quarter for that, until they finally realized, well, this is a really stupid objective. Okay, great in thought, we've got to reduce this this idea of where folks are, or where packages are going that aren't supposed to be, but we can't measure it at the end. We gotta go back to the source, okay? So if a large company like UPS can screw stuff up, the rest of us can kind of screw that up too, right? So we've gotta look at that. Are those objectives, do they make sense? Are they achievable? Are people bought in? If we can't verify all that, it's not gonna work. And that's probably the biggest, biggest challenge to the MBO. Okay, so moving on. So how are we gonna conduct the audit? So, a lot of different ways. We've talked about the audit questionnaire. We've talked about interviewing. Uh, you got to think about the time of year, perhaps, that you want to do this audit. You know, if you're a cyclical business, you're in landscaping, you probably do not want to do it in the summertime. Just, you know, food for thought there. But we got to think about those things. But when you're designing your process, think about these eight items. Okay, I'm not saying it's inclusive. Did I get them all up there yet? Three, four, six, six, one more, yeah. So think about all these items. Now again, we said that maybe you want to piecemeal this. Maybe you don't want to attack all of these at once. So these are just things that I've said, hey, maybe you want to take a look at everything that's involved with this item as opposed to the whole HR function. Is there anything that I've missed that you would add to this list that doesn't fall under one of those categories that you might want to take a look at?
employee engagement. Um, we could put that out or we could throw that under how we measure performance. Sometimes that's an indicator, but I'm okay with that. Anything else? Health and safety, I would agree, if that's in your function, if that's in the HR function at your, you know, your organization, not all obviously are. If it's under your realm, then absolutely get it in there. Yes, ma'am? Onboarding. Onboarding. Um, yeah, I mean, you could throw that under recruitment if you wanted, or you could throw it under training and development if you wanted, but yeah, you gotta, gotta look at that, absolutely. So again, I don't mean this to be an exhaustive list, but these, again, are subsets of what we're doing that we could take a look at and just go after everything related to that function. So as an example, if we wanted to look at comp and benefits, give me one thing we could audit in comp and benefits. Pay equity. Pay equity, there's a good one. Hot topic today, dabbles in compliance, but it's also about treating our people fairly, right? Mm -hmm. Misclassification. Misclassification, we mentioned that one earlier, whether it be IC employee or exempt non-exempt. Okay. Anything else maybe with comp you want to look at? It's more exempt than compensation, but um, um, damage penalty is individual penalty. Okay. Supposed to be on that plan. Ah. So looking at benefits. I was just talking to some benefit friends. Uh, Pennsylvania had our HR conference last week, and I was talking to some old benefit friends. And they just worked with a client, they saved them $60,000 a year by going through and auditing and getting rid of all the people that they were paying for on their plan that were either no longer employed or family members that were no longer eligible. 60000 a year. There's an audit that recovered its cost, right? Because that's not just one-time savings. So absolutely, we gotta, we got to be looking at those things. Okay. So... We can go with any of those items. So from, a, from a, a total look here, so when we look at auditing, we have to prepare what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, and then we have to report back. So when I use the term up here, appropriate staff, what do I mean by that in terms of reporting back to appropriate staff the results of the audit? OK, exactly, the ones that it impacts. So if we just went, earlier we said if I go to that one division or that one shift that I know is causing me problems, do we really need to tell everybody else that we targeted that shift? Yeah. Probably not. I mean, upper management's going to know. But do we need to roll it out to the rest of the facility? Probably not. Right? So this isn't about a witch hunt. We're not trying to you know, make someone a poster child of being a bad boy or anything like that. We're just trying to help them help themselves. So absolutely, but, but management needs to know what's going on for good and bad. This is where we got to have some thick skin and be able to say, hey, did an audit. Here's what I found. Here's my action plan to fix it. Okay. Um, so when we think about this, though, I know one of the things that, that I like to see in an audit report is not just all of the red flag data. I want to see all the green flag data, all the stuff that we're doing well. How often do we just report back the bad stuff? Well, we were only 10% on this, and we were only 80% on that. Okay, let's talk about, wait a minute, in this process, we're killing it, gang, this is awesome. Let's keep doing this, this process works, it's resolved the problem, and now we've got the data that shows that we've solved the problem, and that it's worth investing the time in that process, okay? So report on the good stuff as well. Don't, you know, I, and so what I like to see in an audit report is everything that's been looked at. We looked at this, here's our percent effective, here's all the things we have to fix, and here's the action plan for getting it done. Here we're 100% effective, and here's why. Let's detail it out. Let's get that institutional knowledge in a document for other people to see. So that, you know, God forbid something happens to you, some other key decision maker, we can go back and say, now we know why we're doing it this way. There's no question, there's no someone coming in and reworking data because they don't know why. Okay? So if we can document all of those things, even better. Okay, and then ultimately those remedial measures. Now here's the thing I like to see in those action plans. Well, you tell me, what should be in the action plan? I'm sorry? Timelines, thank you. What are your due dates? We're back to that accountability piece, right? We have to make sure that we're holding ourselves accountable and or the other folks who have been assigned those tasks 
to bring that back. So what's the other thing we need on there? The owners. And then someone else said it, the completion dates. We've got a due date and a completion date. And who owns it? There's probably maybe one other thing that doesn't necessarily have to be on this, but there's one other thing we have to make sure we do. What's the deliverable at the end? What happened once we got this fixed? What does things look like now? How do we ensure it doesn't get broken again after we spent this time to uncover it and fix it? So all of those things should be in that final report. And it can be as detailed, as fluffy as you want, as pretty as you want, or as bare bones as you want. Whatever, again, whatever your style is, whatever your culture is, that's fine. Make sure all of those items are in it. It's absolutely critical. Okay. So, I think we're, we're just about there. We've got about five minutes or so. So let's talk questions. You guys didn't have, uh, you know, well, you did have a lot of chance to ask questions, but let's, let's talk now. We've got a couple minutes here to talk about anything that we didn't hit or things you want to know more about. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, good sample size. So it depends a little bit on what you're looking at. So let's say we're just doing files. We're going to pull some files. I like to start, again, this depends on the size of the organization. I like to start with 20%. Now, if you've got, you say, oh my gosh, Ed, I got 5,000 employees. That's what I, okay, I get it. 20%. Didn't say you had to do it all in a day, but think about what that 20% means. Do we want to pull 20% this year? Maybe that's the goal over the course of the year. It doesn't have to be done all at once. If you have a smaller organization, maybe that 20% needs to be a lot higher. I mean, some of you maybe have 100, 150 employees. You could probably get through that in a year. So I'd say do 100% of that, right? So I think that, that that percentage can ebb and flow based on the size of the organization. But the larger organization, I like to go with them. That's just me. That helps? Now, oh, that's documents. Interview is a different story. Interview is different story because of the amount of time, right? So from an interview perspective, I usually tell someone, give me, if you give me 10 employees, I want two of your best. I want two of your worst, and give me six averages, okay? So of every 10 that I sit down with, I want to make sure that I'm hearing the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? And again, that number is really, from an interview perspective, is really based on the time that we have to do it, because obviously interviews are going to be really time cost costly. And so for every 10, that's my mix, though. I don't want to avoid those bad people, because even though they grumble and we don't like to see them in the halls, there's probably some good stuff that we can get. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I just wanted to add uh, you know, where we get to the sampling mm -hmm. that is important to include the percentage sample in the report. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So, yeah, we're, we don't want to just say we're 100% effective, but yeah, I only pulled 20 files out of 1,000 employees. Okay. Yes, thank you for that, that clarification. We absolutely do want to indicate. I sent out 1,000 surveys. I only received 350 back, and of that 350, here was, here was what we, we got on the results side. So absolutely, thank you for, for adding that in. We want to make sure that that stuff is, is detailed out. So I know we're, we're right at the end of it. Um, some of you received, um, and because we're full, I don't think everyone received uh, the handout with some feedback. If you want to give me feedback and the person next to you has one, go ahead and add on to, to their list. That would be great. Um, I will hang out and, and answer any other questions that, that you have. But thank you so much for your willingness to chat this morning. Thank you.